Hi, and welcome to the Design Systems Podcast. This podcast is about the place where design and development overlap. We talk with experts to get their point of view about trends in design, code, and how it relates to the world around us. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Knapsack. Check us out at knapsack.cloud. If you want to get in touch with the show, ask some questions, or generally tell us what you think, go ahead and tweet us at the DSPod. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everyone. Today, I'm talking with Jenny Yip. She's the lead designer for the Atlassian Design System. She's a hybrid storyteller, designer, developer, renaissance person working on scaling herself across this organization. Hi, Jenny. Welcome. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to chat with you. Um, we kind of were before the show comparing some notes around the the thing we wanted to talk about. And we really kind of landed on this this idea of, of discussing hybrids because you yourself are a hybrid. You were talking about the last time you wrote code, the the work that you're doing as a storyteller. And I thought that that's a really interesting kind of, of approach, a very sort of human-centric approach to thinking about what a hybrid means. It, it just kind of in your own words, describe what you do and, and what being a hybrid is like. Uh, I think being a hybrid means things to different people, but like to me, it's someone who has empathy for multiple disciplines across. So basically, I can uh, sometimes be flexing my muscles as being a designer, sometimes I'm being a developer. And I think my experience in having to be a lone designer and developer for a long time, like for the very beginning of my career, has actually led me to help understand the different parts of what it means to do each discipline. And so we can bring people together with different perspectives and actually like have some kind of intention behind it. So I think like Brad Frost had a great quote about how like he talks about hybrids all the time, right? Like Mm -hmm. he said that design systems give hybrids a home. I super resonate with that. And I feel like the design systems industry right now is like blossoming and full of hybrids. So it's super interesting to see that happening. Yeah. So you feel like like just as an industry, we're generally having this bigger convergence between design and development where you have lots more designers that, excuse me, you have lots more designers that are, are being asked to do more technical tasks than there ever have been, along with a lot of people that are typically on the code side being asked to make a lot of design decisions. And I think that that's a big part about, you know, the idea of democratization of a design team, which is a big topic just in the design systems community right now. Um, you know, Have you seen that same thing happening inside of your organization and your personal experience? And how do you think about that democratization playing out? Mm. Yeah, like, I think it's it's showing how we are actually maturing in the org. So it's like, if you go back, you see, like, we have a lot of communication silos. You have designers working on stuff. You have developers working on stuff. Maybe we're part of the same design system team, but maybe we weren't really working together on things, right? So I think what we've learned in the past year of, like, working on this site that we're going to talk about is, like, when I when I got to Atlassian, there really were a lot of silos. Like, not, not that it's bad and it's not like we are trying to ship our org chart and you know how people think of that as a bad thing but when you reframe that you're kind of looking at that as like ah we actually like we're able to grow and scale so much that we could achieve this level of everything that we've shipped right the change is good yeah i think we learn a lot from even this this project because like you know we actually kick off and you always we were kicking off with design and research first and then we ended up having like oh this is when we can actually plan to have engineers join right Mm -hmm. but then i think what we learned is like we are seeing like we should have kicked off together and then we could have been having that handshake process from the very beginning um, throughout instead of having a handoff. And so I think a lot of different companies and orgs are starting to see this a little bit more, especially ours. And um, this project has really brought our team together. And so I think now we have new projects. Like say we're, we actually were kicked off a new project and we're saying, now we have the designers and developers saying, hey, we need to have both in the same conversation and have the same kickoff. Otherwise, we're kind of like wasting time and redoing things again. Yeah. So having everybody on the same wavelength is a really important part to that. Mm-hmm. And I think that like, you know, we're um, just as an industry sort of still trying to to cast off the vestiges of the print design world. Right. And And not that there's anything against print designers, but I think that we're actually at a point now where there are two really distinct disciplines between design for for the web and for digital as a whole versus how we used to think about production design in in the physical space. And so, you know, it's no longer here's a design team, go make some some physical representations of a product that we then turn into a product. And it's it's then a bunch of engineers that go make that. It's actually like a much more collaborative process from the jump. Yeah. And I think we're seeing like it's not just decorative stuff anymore. 
right? Like, we're not just making things pretty. And like, you know how everyone's saying we design wants a seat at the table. It's like, what are we bringing to the table? We have these different ideas mm -hmm. and we're trying to connect and tell a story and piece everything together. So tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you talk about that connection and, and that storytelling aspect that is really involved in this creative process. It was kind of funny because when I joined last year, I kind of called myself just like a keynote person because I was all I was doing is kind of like going around talking to people trying to find out understand like the context of and landscape of everything and I felt like all I was doing was giving keynote presentations so I was like oh what am I doing here I'm just like giving keynotes shipping decks <laughs> but then you know you, you start to see all the different pieces when you talk to everybody and like connecting the dots and you're, you're kind of like ah oh, so like I can I see why like maybe this kind of fell through the cracks before or like maybe sometimes people just see a problem but then when you kind of see like the bigger picture you see all the opportunities together I learned to get better and really kind of like embrace that kind of space embracing that yes maybe right now at this time my role is to put these pieces of a puzzle together and start telling that story it's interesting because this new site that we launched they researched it for two years before I got there mm -hmm. and it, like it still didn't launch and it still didn't kick off so I think when we got here and we were able to tell a different story we were able to pitch that and kind of get buy-in that way yeah so let's get a little bit more specific like Talk about that story. What's the the site that we're talking about here and, and how did it how did it go from being a project that has been stagnant or, or not progressing quickly for a couple of years to really becoming a thing over the past 12 to 18 months? Um, so we historically we had two reference sites before, one for designers and one for developers. So that's already kind of like a way of shipping our org chart and you can kind of see how we can have communication silos there. So you actually had a separate entire section of the lasting experience that was like design and then an entirely separate one that had a lot of that same stuff that was development. Yeah. So we actually have two literal sites. One was called ADG. Atlassian Design Guidelines. So that was Atlassian.design. And then we have another, uh, which is the implementation of it, which is the React component library. So that was called Atlas Kit. Both of those sites just basically kind of grew and grew and grew and snowballed and became a little bit stuck in time <laughs> for various reasons. So was there anything that really connected the two when you, you first got there? In my interview, I actually asked them, so why do we have two websites? <laughs> but I had no idea that it would actually become kind of like my labor of love for, for that year um, into really bringing across all the content across both sites. Yeah. So it's basically the developers, you know, they want to work in their workflow. So they ship this Atlas kit website and then the designers are working with the content designers. And so they actually had a um, CMS that they had to um, write all the documentation and, and ship that. Gotcha. So because of those two different work streams, it was really hard for for them to synchronize processes for people to really have that that common thread of communication that tied that together. So did that lead to like business outcomes that, that the organization really wanted to change? Yeah. So if you can imagine like as a designer or as a developer, all the different customer pain points you can you can see. So if we are, um, say, publishing aspirational guidelines, so that means the designers are, which is published guidelines that say, hey, this is a best practice and we can have this component be like this. Uh, whereas the developers would code something different. And so over the years, you'll see a whole bunch of inconsistencies just started forming. There'll be like different font weights everywhere, or this component would say it would do this, but it didn't do that. Those pain points. And, you know, when we were pitching or the previous team that was in, uh, researching this project, listen to all the different users and just so many different pain points. And if, if you Consider we also have ecosystem developers. So this means we have people outside of Atlassian that's using the design system to build products that integrate with our products. If they have no idea what's going on on the inside, how do we communicate that to them? So they even have an even far off. Right, they're almost another step removed. Yeah. So what's interesting there is is it seems like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people that listen to this deal with this, right? Where you have this, this really, I guess, traditional serialized process of, there's something that the design works on that gets shipped over to a bunch of developers. The developers work on it. They go back and forth with design, really focusing on fidelity, right? So, so what is the fidelity of that design and who owns that fidelity at what point? And then you then have this ecosystem group that basically consumes the downstream results of that. Is that kind of a, a good picture of the landscape? Yep. So then 
what you're trying to do is is move towards a new model where that model is a lot more integrated, where instead of that more serialized process, there's this much more collaborative parallel workflow process for both design and development. But I, I am curious, how do you how do you get the ecosystem developers into that that new workflow? We're still working on that, but we do have to we we recognize we have to be a little bit more transparent and a little bit and we have to work on more communication strategies. So that's definitely a little bit something that we've been investing in more. Gotcha. So I mean Elassian is is still a youngish company, but you know, it's been around long enough that it's probably got a lot of established practice. So when you're you're in this position of a new employee at Atlassian and you're tasked with basically transforming this organization that has had these traditional workflows. How do you go about doing that? What is the the focus and, and direction that you take to make that goal happen? So Atlassian, we work a lot around our values. And so one of the biggest values that we love is be the change you seek. So I think when I was interviewing, I really resonated with all of our values, but um, I went in kind of going with fresh eyes and I was like, hey, like, oh my gosh, we have this huge, amazing design system. I don't need to do anything anymore. Um, but then when you start looking at behind the curtain and you see all the different things and you're like, oh, actually we have a lot of, a lot of things that we can work on and improve, right? Um, so I think being a new person, I took that to my advantage and to say I have fresh eyes and I can come in here with a new perspective to see things that may have been going on along for a while. And so you can kind of like see more systemic issues that way. Um, but also just like just challenging and being OK with just speaking up and saying, hey, like I want to be I see this and I want to be responsible for changing it. Um, and I think that's where the value comes in. And I, I just like taking responsibility for things. That's great. I think that's a, a great quality in, in any person that's going to go lead some sort of, of effort like this. You know, how did it turn out? in terms of, of your expectations versus the reality. I know that you were talking about how there were a lot more hybrids than than you really thought there were at Atlassian and you kind of were looking to give those people a home. But beyond that, um, you know, I'm sure that there was a lot that had to do with uh, the conversations you had around keynote decks and the conversations around how you actually get these people to work together that was unexpected. What were some of the things that you ran into that maybe you weren't expecting to? I think you really have to treat everything as a teaching moment. And that's how you kind of multiply like systems thinking and all everything that we know and we want to multiply. Right. So, for example, um, I think when we were assessing the architecture of the new website um, and the new documentation site and for reference, we combined those two sites into one and we made the new Atlassian design system. the new home is at Atlassian.design. So it replaced the design guidelines. So when we're thinking about the architecture, um, we really wanted to keep everybody in their best workflow. And so we decided to go with Markdown because that's easier to teach. So um, nicely, by the end of that sprint, when we were um, before, when we were launching, all the designers in our system actually learned Markdown and were able to contribute to the code base. That's awesome. So if you think about it in the lens that you want to teach everybody, then you can also apply that to other disciplines. And so the content designer that I was working with, I think um, she was always kind of feeling like she expressed to me that she didn't understand what Markdown is. And, you know, once you just kind of sit down with somebody and just like spend an hour with them or something to like explain to them what is a design system here or what is Markdown and let's show them some examples. And, and so that's like telling that story in their lens and how they will understand it. Then they'll start to learn and they'll start to adapt and kind of like adapt their workflow. So they were actually like, oh, now they can uh, learn a new skill and they can work in Markdown and they can go in the PRs and read the PRs now as well. Yeah. Markdown is the great unifier. <laughs> um, I, I love that. We, we actually, we take extensive use of, of Markdown and Knapsack as well. And it's, it's interesting to see um, how people go about adopting that as a, as a new way of thinking. Um, but one of the things you mentioned there that, that I really wanted to key into is that storytelling aspect. So when you talk about storytelling inside of an organization and your role as a storyteller going around evangelizing, um, building content related to the stories that you want to tell, explain the role of that and how you view that as like this core part of, of your job to do. 
I think it's super nice to have that kind of like be empowered to tell that story and to be like trusted to tell that story, you know, because you're trying to emphasize something different uh, to the company. So I think very often what people focus on are the tangible aspects of the system. So for so long, we have we have this Venn diagram, and it's funny because it was designed by our designer named Venn, um, but he basically <laughs> outlines... <laughs> He basically outlines like, you know, we, we our design system consists of brand, engineering, content, and design. So it's like a four-way. And so we always focus and show that when we're telling that story of what is the design system here. We have, you know, React libraries, we have Figma libraries, we have, you know, all the tangible things. Um, but I reuse that Venn diagram that everyone already recognizes. And I said, hey, let's not look at the outputs. Let's look at who's building these and what kind of processes and what kind of like relationships do we have to build with these different disciplines across to um, really bring this project together and really um, kind of like not sell, but just tell the story and tell like leadership that it's so important for us to work together so we can get this done. Otherwise, it's not going to get done. Yeah. And I think that it is interesting talking about all those disparate workspaces and having work being done across a, a wide variety of tools, where does that synchronization point happen? And it sounds like you guys really landed on this ADG product um, as the the gathering point for all these different disciplines where everybody could share those stories. I think, um, well, there's a little bit of history to that. So like ADG is about, it was formed in 2012, you know? So this is actually the third version of ADG. Um, and with each one, there was like a big cause behind it. So the first version was kind of like, oh, we just really need to have um, alignment across all the different uh, products, right? And then the second one was more of like, we are kind of developing our brand personality. So it's like kind of mm -hmm. like maturing there. And then the third one was a big brand refresh and then really started to show how our personality was changing and was um, prevalent throughout all the different products. So basically, you know, having it evolve into Atlassian design system is another step of that, uh, I guess, mat maturation process. Gotcha. So you guys thought about it as as sort of this maturity model and and this kind of directional flow where the scope of that was expanding with each new version that would get get delivered. So what's next? Um, it's definitely has snowballed into a big thing. So I think um, it's interesting because I'm. I'm really thinking about the whole entity of what the system is now. And so the, ne the next thing I want to work on is besides like finishing the rest of the migration is like, what is the boundaries of our system? Because right now the mental model at Atlassian is everything belongs in the system. And so it's a little bit tricky to show um, and apply systems thinking to a design system, you know, because when everybody is used to having everything go and filter into the system, then now we're kind of like at this level where we are like, okay, like we've grown so much and now we need to kind of stop and like kind of whittle down and really mold what the system is again. So we can kind of like, um, I guess, strengthen it so we can scale even more. Cause right now we're kind of like reinvesting in some of the foundational things. Great, so do you feel like there's a, a proliferation problem? Because we run into this in the past with with lots of the folks that we talk about, right? Where there's, there's this inflection point around systems thinking where you create the system and then you get people to adopt the system. And that adoption step is really, really key. That's like the, the you know, first major inflection point. And then once everybody's using the system, there becomes this other inflection point where proliferation and complexity um, are reintroduced. Now you have a system of really complex things instead of just a really complex thing. And that that culling and pruning and I guess, you know, tending the bonsai tree that is your your uh, system of systems then becomes the next inflection point. Is that kind of where you feel like you're at or is it something even beyond that. I actually really like how you called it trimming a bonsai plant because <laughs> I love plants. Um, yeah, I think it's another step towards that maturation and like the evolution. And so it's interesting because I think when we released that last big version of the system, um, there's a lot of things that change and different needs, you know, that have changed throughout the years and different tech around systems have emerged, you know. So for example, we don't have um, design tokens 
right? We have、mm-hmm. a form of design tokens in a theme package, but we don't have what everyone is thinking about as that design token layer right now. So we have to start thinking about how do we build these、um, new things to strengthen and mature the system and in, in the infrastructure of the system. In like, how do you slip that into this big? <laughs> House, right? And so, right. How do you do something foundational now that you already have a system? Yeah, and another big part is that you know, through all that auditing and looking through all the different cracks of the system, we realize we need to shape the foundations. So we're actually hardening all the foundations right now. So we have、um, all of our designers working on the type system, a new spacing system, typography system, color system, and we're taking more things like accessibility. Into consideration because now、um, we've just hired an accessibility head at Atlassian, so accessibility is now becoming a first-class citizen. And I love the the story of accessibility and how it relates to design systems and and systems thinking in general. And that a lot of these things, accessibility being the most、um, impactful to users,、um, but also things like performance and and things like uh, uh, you know visual regressions and stuff like that, like how you actually take. A lot of these systems level components or patterns, and test them for all these things, and then you gain that benefit across your entire product ecosystem. Yeah, that's funny because you just named another stream of work that we're working on, which is performance. There's also visual regression testing as part of that,、um, but it's basically you know what are the different things coming down the line that we need to strategize for, you know, because it wasn't built in from the beginning, so now we have to kind of. Um, reinvest that time to 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 make it better. Yeah, and it's it's also interesting too because like I've been telling a big data story about this as well, and I always thought, and, and this is like a a、um, <laughs> an immature maturity model, if you will, right? <laughs> like the the idea of of first it's about your components, then it's about you know the the accessibility and the compliance side of things and the performance testing, all of that like you know network effect stuff you can get from a centralized system. Then it's about the data. And understanding more data about your users, so you can understand how you prioritize the things that are in your system,、um, what you keep, what you call, what you really focus on, based on、um, an audit of how that is actually being used in in end products.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually、um, I really think it's important to consider the quality of your content. So that's another another thing that's happening inside Atlassian. We have a content design org. There's a small guild that's actually trying to create a hypothesis of how to test effective content. You know, so it's just super interesting because、um, how do you measure the effectiveness of your of the quality of your content, right? There's different different ways. There's quant- quantitative ways. There's qualitative ways, and、um, it's interesting because sometimes people are just focused on the data, the numbers, and they'll be like, okay, just tell me, does this how many page views is this doc page getting? But, right, is this driving this amount of engagement? Yeah, but how is that telling a story, and how, like, in what context can you use those numbers to tell the right story? Right, so it doesn't really matter if we get a ton of page views for the new launch or something. It's super hard to measure the quality because the content is different on every single page as well.、Mm-hmm. You know, so there's different ways that they're studying, which is like helpfulness rating、um, and tying that. Back to user feedback, which is like a personal direct feedback loop, and so they're trying to see how we can take all these different qualitative and quantitative measures together to really measure the success of our、uh, content. That's awesome. So I've always thought you guys think about it as a four legged stool. I've always sort of had the mental model of a three legged stool, right? Where you have like your back end services, your content, and then your your front end display. You guys have another aspect of that, but it's essentially the same idea, right? Where content. Is this thing that we haven't really figured out the systems thinking for, and specifically how it relates to the other branches of of systems thinking? So, when you cite your design system, when you think about the role that content plays in that,、um, this is a big frontier, and I don't think that anybody has has really built a robust、uh, content framework inside of their design system yet. But it sounds like you guys are working towards that. Can you tell me a little bit about like your early thinking here and the direction you're thinking about going? Um, for me, I think content without content, you can't design anything.、Um, I have this funny story, which is like a long time ago, I was at another company and they outsourced the complete rebrand to another company, and so basically, what the deliverable all we got was a bunch of templates 
And so it's like fill this hero here and then you can fill a block of content here, you know, so all these different content blocks. Mm -hmm. But they didn't talk to the user. So we ended up with a bunch of deliverables, but we couldn't use them. So like, that's why I, what I emphasize, like you can't really design anything without knowing what that content should be and strategizing about it. So um, when we work on the system and all the content now, like we had an embedded content designer on our team. So basically mm -hmm. we're thinking and talking about what kind of content do you think would be effective here? And what kind of content types and content models can we build and reuse, right? Like, cause we want to connect content models in the CMS, but also like how we kind of chunk that up and have that show up in the developer docs as well. You know, so like we do usability testing around that to see like what kind of content is um, effective. And you can see like, of course, there's things you can measure like readability, legibility, line length. Um, there's also like content quality measures around that helpfulness that I mentioned. We haven't implemented that yet, but we're learning from that other team before we do that. Um, so it's kind of cool, like you're at this scale, there's somebody in the company working on something that you can learn from and, and borrow, right? Right. But yeah, I, I find it super interesting. And when we do the usability testing, um, people notice like the difference, like for the examples, we used to have very convoluted, um, kind of overwhelming examples. So if you look at the Atlas Kit site, you'll still see those really jam packed examples that do everything. And you can like, they're basically a little playground in each example. Right, here's a kitchen sink. Yeah. And then now we actually clarified and cleaned up every single example to be like, here's a very simple, clear, intuitive example that anyone can use. So a designer or a developer, but also a content designer. So if you start to think that the system is actually, um, the audience is widening, right? So we need to design the content now in a way that anyone can also absorb it. So it could be a very beginner uh, developer, or it could be a very senior person. Gotcha. And so that, um, that sort of contextual model for content is a really fascinating idea. Like thinking about sample content inside of design system, thinking about content that showcases both primary use cases and edge cases, and also thinking about how like you could potentially even store content in the design system are all these really interesting ways of thinking about how, how content interacts. And I think you brought up another one that is also, um, I guess, uncommonly considered, and that is is the content of the actual documentation for other people inside of the the organization. And so, I think it's great that you have this very multifaceted approach where you have content design and and actually like content authorship sort of embedded with your team to help make sure that that's being thought about. Yeah, I think it's interesting because speaking of hybrids, it's like everybody's like learning a new skill. So now I feel like we are learning about how to do UX writing a little bit better, you know? So like when I mentioned that usability testing where we learned that, you know, chunking, for example, like as much as we want to write all the docs and stuff, we found that it's important to chunk up content so users can absorb it better. So sometimes put an image here or like, you know, when to break mm -hmm. that up. So now you have all the different disciplines thinking about that because we're kind of like sharing those learnings with everybody. So everybody gets a lesson in, in pacing <laughs> for their content that is brought to you by that, that sort of systems view. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really incredible story of, of kind of how you, you went from this system through this, this, you know, uh, I guess maturity needle into now this, this new place where you have all of this better capability to tell your story and to, again, give those hybrids a home. Um, and I love the idea of this constant learning of, of new disciplines and this interaction between what used to be siloed teams in a way that feels a lot more collaborative. Um, what are you seeing that's been the big benefits of this? Um, I think like, what's got you excited about about this this big launch? Like what <laughs> what is like like OK, it's there. Now what's happened? <laughs> I think it's definitely changing the culture of the not just the team, but I think it'll slowly grow across the company. Um, when you see things, different new things become part of your conversations, it's, you're seeing that culture sh shift, right. And change and mm -hmm. improve. And I think, you know, when I came in last year, I was like, oh, we're not even working together. I wish we were always working closer together. And to now, like, even the, like, if you observe the banter between our team, you can see how, how we're closer and we're working together closer, how we're vouching for each discipline to be represented every, at every step that kind of stuff, I, I, I love it. And so I feel like, um, you know, that project was the first project, every single one 
like all 30 of us had contributed to it because we did a swarm and everybody helped upload or, or write the documentation, everything. So every single person on that team helped. And that was the first project we did. So I'm really excited for the, for all of our future projects. That's awesome. So now that you have this, this new place where your culture is enabling collaboration, you're having more communication happening between various members of the team, what has really the benefit been? What's What's been brought on as a result of that? I think it's starting to show up, um, like cultivating culture. It's starting to show up in little bits and pieces everywhere. So it's like not only are we vouching for each other, it's, it's showing up in our discussions. It's showing up in like our rituals. Like we have a weekly where we just kind of just, you know, talk about things. And um, especially in time of COVID, you know, like um, I went to Australia to visit the team uh, right before COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And like, it was really great to like, get that bonding time with them because I spent two weeks there with them. Um, But for, you know, all the different teammates that have been onboarding since then, so they have a completely remote experience, right? So how do we change those things? So one example is, um, you know, say all the developers are working in their workflow and then they're working on all these things and it's super complicated, but how do they write a run book uh, that can kind of onboard and Mm -hmm. help another developer that's just joined? Um, know what to do and know how to like take care of something, some kind of task. And so we have heavily invested during this time right now to kind of also improve the onboarding experience of our whole team. So we've onboarded maybe four to six people now completely remote, you know, and for them to like connect with the team and feel that bond. I I think like we're, we're lucky that we felt we found these people that are, are super, I don't know, open and, and like, we were always like, Hey, let's just have a coffee and just catch up and stuff. Like we have, uh, we just hop on these voice calls and on, on like a discord. Right. Um, and you know, we're just like hanging out even if we don't want to, or, or don't have a meeting. <laughs> yeah. I use discord for hanging out with all my, my dungeons and dragons buddies now, uh, now that we can't meet up in person, I, by the way, I think it is remarkable that you basically took uh, an organization that was in physical space, but siloed and through COVID and through the systems approach to things, uh, made it a more collaborative organization with less physical interaction. I think that that's a pretty incredible testament to the power of systems and your work around this transition. So that's, that's commendable and it's amazing. Thanks. Well, I, I know that you also had talked about how systems thinking is kind of permeated your life as as a result of your career pathway and we're both lovers of plants uh we were chatting about plant propagation and shipping some plants back and forth tell me a little bit about how you look at the role of plants and the role of systems it's so fascinating right because systems thinking you start to see all the different things that affect the cause and effect of everything and like when you get into plants you're just like oh this is really cool i just want one plant (laughs) right it's never just one plant and then (laughs) It's like one M&M. and then like, yeah, and then like you you start to go into the community and you're like, ah, oh, like, oh, look at this other plant. I want this plant too. And then the next thing you know, your your plant uh, collection has grown. Um, but then you start learning about other things like propagating and how just cutting a node and cutting a leaf can multiply into other things. Um, so you, you can see how systems thinking can be pulled from there. But you can also borrow those kind of things and apply it to like what you're working on, right? So it's like, how do I multiply the mental model of what my foundation designers, these designers are investing so much time and we're so lucky that we have such a large team that we can spend hours and hours and months on the color accessibility of our system. Mm -hmm. How do we take what they're learning and transfer that mental model to the other 300 designers in the company? So they can understand a little bit how to design systemically, but also just like take that mental model. And even if they go to another company, they can also start their own system. Maybe. So those people are are the propagation. Yeah. Uh, They're they're the cutting that you you go plant somewhere in another team. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because like at my previous company, it was just two of us that built our design system. So two UX engineers and we supported maybe about 20 designers there. And then when I came to Atlassian, a lot of the other uh, designers went to other companies too. And then it was so great to get that feedback that like, hey, like because of our design system, I'm starting the design system there. 
So that's our way of like multiplying and like sharing that knowledge. Yeah, that's awesome. I, <laughs> I've actually really loved that about kind of watching this industry, you know, from from mostly the inside for the past three and a half years is seeing nobody having design systems titles three and a half years ago. We're very few people. Yeah. And then now you see them them kind of across most of the major big organizations and you're starting to see it in a lot of the smaller ones too. You know, we work with a lot of, of mid-sized startup companies that have people that have come from roles like yours that have gone and decided to start a new business. And through that entrepreneur event venture are taking that systems thinking approach with them. And I think that that proliferation in the industry is creating this this beautiful garden that we all get to live inside of now. Love it. One one last question for you. What's the the design systems equivalent of showing up at a plat, plant auction at 4 a.m. so that you can get the best deal on those really sick new new plants that have just shown up? Wow, I have never tried that because they, they just literally like exponentially skyrocket to like thousands of dollars. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> so like a little bit embarrassingly, we when we were outfitting our, our office back when we had an office, uh, we went to a lot of plan auctions to try to get stuff for our living walls because um, we had living walls, which was super cool. And yeah, it's it's a lot of like, hey, show up before it's light outside and go bid on a bunch of brand new plants that just got off of a, a shipping container. <laughs> it, That's awesome. If you've never tried it, it's totally worth it. It's a crazy experience. It's it's like going to any I'm other... I'm afraid that might open up another avenue of my collection. <laughs> <laughs> You never have too many, but I mean, you know, my, my wife thinks otherwise, but anyway, it was super great talking to you. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat. I look forward to keeping this conversation going and yeah, I really am excited to see uh, where you guys head with this new system. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. That's all for today. This has been another episode of the design systems podcast. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or a topic you'd like to know more about, find us on Twitter at the DS pod. We'd love to hear from you with show ideas, recommendations, questions, or comments. As always, this pod is brought to you by Knapsack. You can check us out at knapsack.cloud. Have a great day.